Rejoice because our Savior has come. Father, we honor you and we praise you in this place tonight. And we thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy to us. And Lord, you are Emmanuel, God with us, Lord. And as the prophet said, that, that a virgin would give birth to a, a child and we would call him and he would be called Emmanuel, God is with us. And so thank you, Lord. Thank you that we're never alone, and that we're never without help. And so we honor you in this place tonight. Hallelujah. And Father, we just, we pray. We pray for our nation tonight, Lord God. We lift up, Father God, our, our leaders, Father God, and we pray. Father, as we've been praying for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit, pray, Father God, for divine intervention in our nation, Lord God. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, because we know, Lord God, it's not, it's not a party, Father God, that's going to bring us back to, to you. It, it's a divine move of your Spirit. And we thank you. As you said in Zechariah 10, ask the Lord of the rain to send the rain. And so we ask you to send your rain on this nation. To send your rain, Father God, on, on every, every person, Father God. No matter nationality, no matter their status in life, no matter where and what position they may hold, they need you. We all need you. And so, Lord, it was just celebrating. We think of this time of the year, Lord God, and that God is with us. Thank you, Lord God. We give you glory and honor and praise. Amen. Well, you may be seated. Welcome. 
everyone. We're glad you're here tonight and uh, on this week before Christmas. It's hard, hard to believe, right? And uh, so praise God for that and uh, hallelujah. I just want to, uh, you know, we've been uh, talking about on, on Sunday mornings. Uh, this Sunday I'm going to talk about mighty God and taking it from Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 that and, uh, unto us the son is given, unto us a child is born. And his name shall be called. Wonderful counselor, what we looked at last Sunday. And then this coming Sunday, we're going to look at Mighty God. And then on December 29th, just going to lay out some things and talk about uh, as we look into 2020, uh, some vision, some changes that we're going to be doing. Not, not bad changes, good changes, and uh, just some things that we, uh, as a staff, we've been going through this past year and some things we feel we can improve and help us to uh, better reach more people. And, and minister to you better and such. So uh, we'll be talking about that. So please don't miss that service, and we'll talk more about it on, on Sunday as well. And, and some, you know, I, and I realized, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. My dad, um, when it came to things around the house, he did not like change. You know, if my mom moved the furniture, he just was like, he didn't like it. You know, if she rearranged things, you know. When it comes to the church, he just always felt there needed to be change. It was good change. You know, and I tell people, I tell, you know, I've told staff, and in fact, I think I noticed the, the youth uh, uh, budget just kind of glanced at it, they're wanting to repaint. I'm like, yeah, awesome. Mm-hmm. Paint's cheap, right? Inexpensive. I'm going to say it's cheap. Yeah. Inexpensive in a good way. And everybody, oh, it looks new, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, just a little, you know, just a little, little bit of paint, right? And so just some things, but I want to talk about uh, four areas of Jesus' involvement in your life tonight. And, uh, you know, when we celebrate Christmas, sometimes we, we think of the birth of Jesus, that that was his beginning. But that was just his entrance into this world. He's always existed. You know, it says in John 1.1 1, 1, that the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And, and so God, Jesus Christ has always existed. And uh, kind of give you a little, you know, the Trinity, right? He's the third, second person of the Trinity, God the Son. And so it's his entrance into the world and, and looking at that, and, and it, it wasn't his beginning. And, and so he wants to be involved in our life. Amen. And we forget that. You know, we know that, you know, we'll say, yeah, well, you know, so-and-so needs Jesus as a Savior, but Jesus wants to be involved in our life every day, Amen. not just at Christmas time, all, all through the year, yeah. right? 365, next year 366, because <laughs> it's leap year. <laughs> Right? He wants to be involved in our lives. And the Bible says this in Hebrews 13, 8. He's the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, forever. He's the same. He doesn't change. Now, now, what happens, a lot of times we see different things is because we get a deeper revelation of who he is. Get a deeper understanding of his nature, his character, his ability. And so it might look like he's changed. And, and, and in, in his interaction. You know, from the Old Testament to the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, yeah, there was a change because of the way he interacted, because now Jesus had come, right? So the first thing uh, that uh, is you need to invite him. You need to invite him every day. You know, we, we think of an invitation, you know, we think of a pastor or a minister giving an invitation to receive Jesus Christ. Well, every one of us, every one of us, we need to invite him to be involved in our daily life because he, he desires to. He wants to be involved in our life. And, and I think we forget about that sometimes in the hustle and bustle, not just this time of the year, just all the year through, the hustle and bustle of life. And, and, and so we have, to, we have to decide the level of involvement that we want Jesus in our life. We have to decide that. How much do we want? You know, and sometimes, you know, I, I don't remember, and I, don't, I can't remember what they called it, but we used to, remember when I first started in youth group in ninth grade, and it had the circle, remember the, the circle? And then it had a cross in the middle, and then it had a heart, and it had a throne, and, and, and sometimes, so if you weren't born again, the heart was outside the circle, but then the heart could be in the circle, but, but you were still on the throne, right? I was, listening to, uh, I was listening to Rick Renner today, and he was talking about Jesus being dedicated. He was talking about Jesus and, you know, and, and such, and uh, uh, babies and such being dedicated. And, you know, a lot of times that we do that, but it's more for the parents, right? It's not, you know, it's not for that child. A lot of times they're... But, but he was going on, he talked about it. He said, have you committed your or dedicated your brain? You know, think of our heart. 
But have we dedicated our brain? In other words, have we sanctified and such? But that's, uh, I just, is Jesus involved in your life? You know, we need to ask our question, ask ourselves a question. Has his power subsided? Or has our expectation diminished? Has his power diminished? Or has, I mean, has his power subsided? Or has our expectation diminished? diminish and that's why every day we need to invite him into our lives because his power has it he's the same but as our expectation now some you know but the bible talks about in proverbs that hope deferred makes the heart sick Mm -hmm. hope deferred well what is hope hope's that confident expectation hope is like the vision it's the goal that we shoot for it's the blueprint you know it says in uh, hebrews 9 11 now faith is the substance of things hoped for not wished for Hoping and wishing are, are two different things. Sometimes people, when they say, I'm hoping, a lot of times what they mean is I'm wishing it would happen. But a, a true biblical hope is a confident expectation, and it, it's the blueprint. In other words, it's, it, it's what your faith, it's the goal, it's the vision of what your faith can latch on to. Okay? And so, again, we need to, is, is his power subsided, or is my expectation um, Diminish. Another question we uh, need to ask, has my relationship with Jesus become ordinary and or com- comfortable? Has my relationship with him become ordinary? And we go through life. You know, we've talked about this. I, I love the revelation of, you know, the God knowing God and being involved and God wanting to be involved in our life. You know, I was raised in a church and talked about this before. I saw God as this, you know, old guy sitting on a throne with a big long beard and a big stick and just waiting to beat you over the head with it. And then you get the revelation of, you know, he's a personal God, a personal Savior. And, and, and you know, and I've watched things, you know, it's like, so that was a ditch, you know, looking at God as this mean guy and stuff like that. But then we go way over here and, you know, he, he, he's my mate. No reverence for him. No, he just becomes ordinary, and and we become comfortable and and such. And and in a sense, God, you know, the, the, here's the paradox: God wants us to be comfortable with him, but to remember who he is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He wants us to be able to be comfortable in the sense that we can come to him and we can talk to him, but never forgetting who he is: that he is God, yeah. that he is the all powerful, that he is the mighty God. He is the, the wonderful counselor. He is uh, who he says he is, right? And we don't want to forget that. So, so number one, invite Jesus every day to be an active part of your life. Number two, examination. In other words, study him, right? Study him. Now, when I play football, and so every week, high school and, well, varsity football and then, and then you know, college and stuff like that. But every week, we had a, we had a game plan. And and they would the coaches would print that out and 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 uh, <laughs> this is back during the mimeograph days. You know, how many I remember that? You, you, know, you smell it because it just. Anyways, no, I wasn't into you know I didn't get high. Okay. We got just a little bit of echo going on in here tonight. So um, so anyways, so we examined, we studied, and so we studied that, and and you know maybe we watch. Uh, we would watch film of the other team. In, high, in college, Sunday nights, we'd meet, and we'd watch film of our, our, our game, and then the coach would, you know, Kevin, you did this wrong, or, you know, whoever. They'd go through it. But then on Monday, then we, we would watch some film of a, another team, and then they had it available, and they had it broken down. Offense, you get to watch, you'd watch the defense, and I don't know how they did all this. Like I guess they had two cameras going, and then the defense, they'd watch the other offense and such and so you would you would study that and and you would you would you would look at it and you know if you were in this formation this is what the defense would do and if you were in that formation if you did motion and you know type of thing and and you got into the game it was kind of interesting because there were certain things certain keys that you had that you know when when we we'd set a you know receiver doing this and then another guy come in like this well this linebacker would go with that first receiver with a guy coming in here he'd be open and you had that key because you'd watched film and you knew that the guy coming in, as soon as you saw that linebacker, the guy coming in, what we call a curl, he'd be open. You studied that. You studied film. You studied the, the tendencies and stuff. Well, in the same way, we need to study Jesus. Right? 
We need to look at his character. We need to look at his, at his nature. And how do we do that? We study scripture. But not only studying scripture, you need to take time to, to wait on him. And you need to take time to, to listen and to quiet. You know, we've talked about that some. And pursue him. Right? Pursue him. And what do I mean by that? You know, if you, if you love Jesus, you're going you're gonna to want to know him more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's so much more that, you know, we know some. But Paul says we, we, we know we're you know, like a glass darkly. We're looking in a glass darkly. And, and we only know a little bit here on this side of this earth. But we can know more. And, and it does take time. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, Pastor Gil talked about le- looking forward to 2020. And, you know, let's start now. Don't wait for 2020. You know, i got a two-week reprise here. You know, I'm just going to kind of rest and coast. And <laughs> no, we don't want to do that, right? Because I guarantee the devil isn't resting. Amen. And so we study him. And, and if Jesus isn't the first place in our life, everything else is in the wrong place. Say that again. If Jesus isn't in the first place in our life, everything else, it's all skewed. Right? You know, have you ever looked through? I can remember when I was a kid putting my mom's glasses on, you know, because I didn't need glasses. I can remember putting them on and make me dizzy, you know, and everything would move. And I was like, Mom, how do you wear these, you know? And, and, and then, then when they got bifocals, I was like, wow, this is really crazy, you know, and, and such. And I've been blessed all my life with good eyesight. And, and, um, but, you know, you ever look through a prism or you ever look and it, it'll, it'll bend the light, it'll do things with the light, or you can look through, uh, you know, they got, what is that game, googly eyes or whatever, they ever, I just saw it, I don't know, <laughs> anyways, and I guess the eyes, we played it last year, right, yeah, remember that? And you put it on, and it's just, it makes things look weird and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's, see, when Jesus isn't in the right place, that's what, that's what happens. And things get skewed. Things get, they, they don't look right. And uh, things are limited. Did we just lose me? Or what? Some just with the, all right. Things are limited when Jesus isn't in the right place. And so we want to examine him. We want to study him. See, the Bible is not just for you. It's about Jesus. It is for you. But if we're, if we're not careful, we forget. We forget about that. We forget that it's, the, you know, not just the New Testament. You can go back. And, and, I, and I thought, you know, if I, uh, I wasn't here, I got it uh, here. I don't have it at home. But in Genesis, every book of the Bible, Genesis, he's a seed. Exodus, he's a lawgiver. I can remember a few of them. You know, uh, Leviticus, he's the Passover lamb. Joshua, he's the captain uh, of heaven's armies. Right? Psalms, he's the, uh, he's the shepherd. Right? Matthew, he's the king. Mark, he's the, he's the servant. Luke, he's the physician. John, he, he's the uh, uh, you know, everlasting king, the everlasting Lord. Acts, he's the miracle worker. Every book of Revelation, he's the king coming again. Every book of the Bible, every book of the Bible speaks of him. And, and so, so if, if he's not first place, then he's going to be in the wrong place. Or we're going to be, or everything else is going to be in the wrong place. And Jesus saturates every part of the Bible. Amen. He saturates. And guess what? It's not like your chemistry experience, uh, you know, experiments, you know? Remember, you know, you know anybody remember chemistry? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and you would do those solution you know, and you put a bunch of sugar, you put a bunch of salt, or, you know, and then it become oversaturated. The, the water could only take up, the, or, you know, salt could only dissolve so much, and then after a while, that all, the extra salt would fall to the bottom because it was oversaturated. Can't get oversaturated with Jesus. Can't get oversaturated with his, his life. So he needs to be first place, because if he's not, Everything else is going to be in the wrong place. Then number three is expectation. You have an expectation. Believe him, but also receive him. Right? You know, say we believe in him, but are we receiving him? And going back to that, you know, the circle with the heart and the cross and the throne, you know, and and sometimes in our heart there's, you know, there's places that we don't want to give them. Right? Let's be honest in here today. Right? We don't want to give them certain places in our heart. And, and so there's that examination. But, but it's beyond that. It's, it's receiving him and in believing him. And, and in Luke chapter 1, 
verse 45, and we'll look here in a minute at, at, at a couple other verses, but uh, Zechariah was prophesying, and he was speaking about Mary, and he says, you are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. You are blessed. You know, guess what? That applies to you and I. When we believe that the Lord will do what he said he will do, right? We are blessed. Uh, and so it's important that you believe before you receive. You know, people will say, well, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, that's not faith. Faith believes it. And faith sees it with the, you know, we call it the eye of faith, or we call it with the, the eye of the, you know, the spirit, so to, so to speak. Faith believes it before I ever receive it. And, and that's where, when Paul talks about having done all to stand, that's where the standing comes in. You know, and then people ask, well, pastor, what do I do from the moment, you know, say I pray about something or I'm declaring things and, and faith is there. So what do I do from the, you know, that moment I pray to the moment, you know, until I receive it, you know, that in between, what do I do? You give thanks. Amen. You praise him. That's, that's, that's what you do. That's the standing that we do sometimes. You know, now the Bible talks about a rest, but it's not that we don't do anything. Right? And I'm not talking about working for your salvation, but, but there is a working out of our salvation that we are to do. And so from that, in between the time that you believed, remember what Jesus said in Mark 11, 24, uh, he says, believe that you receive when you pray. Mm -hmm. Right? Not after. Believe you receive when you pray. And so it's important to believe that you do what you believe before. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 70, or Luke chapter 1, the first part of it, um, the angel appears to Zechariah. And, and they didn't have any ch children, Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. And, and so the angel appears to him and he begins to talk to him. You know, you're going you're to have a son and, and he's going to be a forerunner of Jesus. And, you know, he, he tells him all these things. And, and then uh, verse 13, the angel says, Don't be afraid, Zechariah, for the Lord has heard your prayer. Okay, don't be afraid. So he tells them all these things. And then we go down to verse 18, and Zechariah says, how, how can I be sure this is going to happen? Okay? And I know for a long time, in, in reading Luke chapter 1, I, I was wondering, okay, I said, Lord, this seems kind of unfair, because you, 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 know, you made John, uh, or Zechariah, he became mute, couldn't speak, until John the Baptist, or until his son was born, you know, and you know, kind of looking at what Mary, well, I missed the point, that the angel came in response to the prayer. They'd been asking for a son. They'd been praying for a son. But he doubted, how can this be? I'm an old man. My wife is old and we're beyond childbearing uh, years. Well, the Bible says, I've come in response to your prayer. I remember Brother Hagin used to say this. He said, <laughs> he said some people wouldn't recognize the Holy Spirit if, if he showed up with a red hat and red shoes right in the middle of their service. And they still wouldn't recognize the Holy Spirit. And sometimes when things come to us, if we're not careful because we haven't invited Jesus into our life, because we haven't, you know, made him first and things are out of the wrong place, he shows up and we don't recognize it. And here, in an answer to their prayer. Now, if you go on and look at the difference in Mary's response, go, go over there to Luke chapter 1. Uh, Luke chapter 1. And her question, because they both asked questions, but, but Mary's was, it was, it was done in a different way. And so Luke chapter 1, so Zechariah said, how can this be? Because I'm an old man, and my wife is old, and we're beyond childbearing years. But in verse, verse 34, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I do not know a man? And I remember I, I used to, I was like, God, that doesn't seem fair. You didn't, you didn't make her mute not be able to speak for nine months or whatever whatever it was. But see, she hadn't been praying. She hadn't asked God to come. Yeah, hey, God, I want, to have, I want to have the Savior. I want to bear the child, you know. How can this be? Because I know not a man. In other words, she hadn't had any, she hadn't had any relations with a man that would produce a child. How can this be? And so then the, whole, then the angel tells her. I was meditating about that. Just think about that. Back in Genesis, 4,000 years before this, back in Genesis, God promised a redeemer. God spoke a word. A redeemer will come. And so for 4,000 years, he kept, kept speaking. He got things lined up. 
God things. The Bible says in the fullness of time, uh, the, the Son of God came. In Galatians, Paul says. And so he finds, a, he finds a young lady. And he appears, or an angel comes. Because you know, you know, we know this was from God. How can this be? I know not a man. The power of the Most High will come upon you. Right? The power. And then the angel goes on and says, with man, or with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Hallelujah. And see, it's possible with us, too. And there's two things. Two things I want to get you, get, you, get you out of here. No, two things I want you to get out of this and believe in him. See, Mary chose to believe what the angel said. So there's be bold in your praying. Okay? Be bold in your praying. Matthew 7, 7, 7 says, ask. Everybody say ask. Ask, ask and it shall be given unto you. John 15, 7 says, if I, if you abide in me, Jesus talking, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you shall ask what you desire and it shall be, what? Done for you or given unto you. Hallelujah. So the importance is it's abiding in, and that means to make our habitation there. That's what that word abide means. We're making our habitation there, that we're in the Word, but we're letting the Word get in us. We're meditating, studying, we're, we're digesting the Word, we're, you know, uh, we're, we're in church, we're listening to the preaching and teaching of the Word of God throughout the week. We're listening, you know, as we were singing that, you know, We Three Kings, I've been listening to Rick Renner, and he's kind of, he's kind of, you know, uh, just upset the apple cart, you know, all the traditional things that, you know, we think of, and, and at Christmas time and such, and, uh, and I still like the song so <laughs> anyways um but you know listen to the things to build yourself up and to, and to learn and that type of thing and then first john five fourteen, this is the confidence that we have if we ask anything according to his will it shall be done for us and then number two there's power in speaking god's word there's power in speaking god's word proverbs eighteen twenty one says death and life in the power of the tongue but there's so many more scriptures and stuff. And so we rehearse God's promises. It's not for God, it's for us. And there's a renewing of the mind when we rehearse God's promises, when we're, when we're constantly, you know, uh, in the Old Testament, and, and, you know, during Jesus' time, they got religious about it, and they had these big bands and things on, you know, on their forehead. And, I mean, they literally, and in those things, they had the Scripture written. And, and so, you know, they made a religious show out of it. But, but see, the, the premise there, or the, what the, the idea there is the Word of God, just constantly the Word of God. Why? Because the word is seed. And every seed produces after its kind. And so when I'm thinking, not only just thinking about the word, but I'm speaking it out, what am I doing? I'm renewing my mind, I'm, my brain, and not only that, but then I'm, things are changing. And we don't always see it. We don't see it right away. You know, you, when you plant a seed, you believe that there's inherent power in that seed and when it, when it, you know, gets in the soil, and so then there's things in the soil that cause that seed to reproduce, and then pretty soon, what? The stalk and the blade, and then the fruit, right? For some things, it takes longer. You know, for an orange tree, grew up in an orange grove. Or not grew up, but lived in, a, lived in an orange grove. And, you know, it's kind of an amazing thing when you think of how many seeds are in an orange. In one tree. And just in one orange. And every one of those seeds is able to produce another orange or a tangerine or a grapefruit. It's amazing. And God's given us natural things to help us to understand spiritual things. And so every seed will produce after its kind. The Word of God will produce after its kind, but I have to meditate on, it, on His promises and I have to think about His faithfulness and, and even declare, God, you're faithful. I know you're true to your Word. And, and it's just reminding yourself, you know, you're not twisting God's arm. You're just aligning yourself with what he is, what he's already said. So expect his involvement in your life. We invite him into our life. We, we, we put him first so that everything, everything else isn't wrong. And then expect him when you ask him to come. Right? Expect him to be involved in your life. Now, you may not feel anything. Right? may not sense anything, but by faith, 
Because God, the Bible says it's impossible to please him without faith. So I just believe. When I invite him and in, ask him to be involved in my life, I just expect he's there, right? Whether I feel him or not. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I sense his presence. And, and it's a blessing. And I think God does that just every once in a while for us, just to just let us know, right? Just like, yeah, I'm here. When I walk by faith, right? Even when you don't sense me. Even when you don't feel me. Even when you don't, you know, people, oh, I know Jesus is here because I got goosebumps. Well, I know Jesus is here because he said he would be here. Yeah. Whether I get goosebumps or not, I mean, I might just be cold. All right, and then number four is remediation. Remediation. He is what you need. And what is remediation? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's the act of remedying. All right, it's the solution or the answer, the cure. Or we could say it's the antidote. Not antidote, it's the antidote. Okay? In John 8 58, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. You know, there's seven I am's you can find in, in the book of John that Jesus, that Jesus declared who he is. Jesus is the I am. What does that mean? He's the answer. He's the antidote. What's an antidote? Well, when, when if you drank poison and you got to you know take you to the hospital and they're going to give you an antidote or they're going to give you medicine that that counteracts the poison, that nullifies the poison. Well, or we could say you know a good way of looking at it is it cancels out the poison. Well, sin is poison. And Jesus is the antidote. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and he doesn't just, you know, it's not just cancel, you know, uh, uh, nullifying it. He cancels it out. Makes it of no effect in your life. Hallelujah. But not only is it sin, but all that has come with sin. Sickness and disease and lack and, and troubles and worry and all these other things that come with sin. Sin's that poison. Jesus is the antidote, and he nullifies the effects of sin in our life by his blood. Amen. And so I expect his involvement in my life. Romans 10, 17, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, we use that in the Romans roadmap. You know, you know the Romans roadmap, uh, if you're a good Baptist, you know what the Romans road. <laughs> Learned that years ago, you know. All of sin come and fallen short of the glory of God, right? And then, you know, the, then, you know, goes through and there's scriptures in John and whoever, you know, Jesus is standing at the door and knocks, whoever opens up, right? And then Romans 10, 17, or Romans 10, 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's not just saved from your sins. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, Jesus. Call on Jesus, right? So he'll save you. But that word save there, there's different Greek words for the word save. So tira, uh, uh, it means to, it's a recovery, it's a remedy, it's a uh, rescue, or whatever. And I think I've, I've shared the story. My mom and dad, or when my mom started, she wanted to uh, bring in extra income, and she wanted to, to work, and so she called, it was called rent a maid and, and so she would hire, uh, growing up in Florida, we lived about eight, eight miles from the Gulf beaches, and, and a lot of people, they'd winter down there, and so they were used to having housekeepers, and, and some of them wasn't, they just wanted companionship. Sometimes there was older couples or older women, they just wanted companionship, you know, and five days a week, so my mom hired these people out, and, and so, and, and it was, there was, a, there was about five black ladies that they regularly hired out, and, and they were Christian, most of them were Christian. And so I can remember my dad, my dad's weaving in and out of traffic and, and, and Jesus and go like that. And, and my dad, so, you know, we're, we're raised, that's a cuss, you know, that's cussing, you know. And, and, and so he commented one time, he said, I thought you ladies said you were, you were a Christian. Oh, oh, we are, Mr. Goodman, we are. He says, well, why are you swearing? You know, oh, Mr. Goodman, we're not swearing. <laughs> And it's the way you're saying Jesus. And they're like, well, well, Mr. Kibben, the Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and sometimes your driving scares us, so we just, <laughs> we're calling on the name of the Lord. 
Now, it's a funny story, but guess what? It's true. I mean, it works. It's truth. You know, sometimes we think we've got to do the long prayer. Jesus. Jeremiah 33, whoever calls upon the, you know, it says call and I will answer you. Jesus shows up, right? You know, sometimes the world catches on to some of these things and, you know, I don't know why this just popped in. How many ever watched the movie, and don't be sanctified in here, how many ever watched the movie, this uh, Santa Claus, the, the, the Santa Claus with Tim Allen, the very first one? And remember he had the snow globe? The little boy, I can't remember what his name was. He had the snow globe. And so, you know, what, you know, because, you know, dad's become Santa Claus now, and he's living in the North Pole, and he's got to live back wherever he is. And, and he said, all I got to do is just shake that snow globe, and I'll show up. So, of course, he takes off, and, um, you know, and, and he goes, what you doing? I just left. Wanted to see if it worked. Mm -hmm. Right? I know it's a movie. But, but the premise is there, if I call on Jesus, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, even just practice it, driving down the road, Jesus. Not in an not in irreverent way, not in a, you know, what is that? What do you mean practice it? So if you're having in a situation, it just, yeah. I remember Brother Copeland hearing him talk about it. And at first of all, I heard him say this, and then I thought, you know, that's, 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 that's just good. I, I remember talking about how he just go around. You know, and he was dealing with, you know, and he was talking about walking in love. And he said, you know, I just go around. And, and he goes, I, I go into a certain, you know, uh, what do you call it, like Lowe's or Home Depot. And just, I, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. And he was practicing. Now, they hadn't done anything. But he was practicing. And we, and we think, you know, type of thing. And, and see, if we don't prepare. If you don't, if you're, if you're kind of not meditating on that, you know, you know, what was the pastor said? Boom. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago when we were decorating the church and, you know, and it, it was Monday after uh, Thanksgiving, and we, you know, the snow. And the, so we were, uh, Randall, we would come to the interstate and my wife was in front of me and I'm behind her and I hit the brakes and then I hear the, Arr! you know, when you have the anti-lock and I thought, I'm not going to stop. And so I, had, I pulled over to because I thought if I could, I was just sliding. And I thought, I'm going to run right into the back end. That, that would not be good, you know. <laughs> but to, anyways, and so I pull out, and she's looking at me. I was like, roll down. The, she's looking at me like, why are you over there? We're going to go this way. <laughs> I said, I couldn't stop. I was going to slide, right? Well, you want to be ready. Say, Jesus, yeah. right? No, it's not just, you know. Well, you know, I'm sliding, I'm just going to, you know, if you can get out of it, you get out of it. But there's times we've got to be, we've got to know. Yeah. Jesus, whoever calls upon the name. So have that expectation. He said, I am. He goes on to say, I am the bread of life in John 6, 35. And then he says, whoever eats of this bread will live forever. So how do we, how do we, you know, it kind of freaked them out. You know, they're like, they're, they're Jewish. And Jesus, you're talking about cannibalism and stuff and, 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 you know, I'm the bread of life. Whoever eats of me, you're right. And you're like, no, no, no. He's, he's the life. I am. How do we do that? Right here. How do we eat of the bread of life? The word. Reading it, meditating in it, and on it, studying it, speaking it out of our mouth. That's how we, that's how we partake of the bread of life. And he talks about, you know, when he told the woman at the well, you know, if you drink of me, I'm going to give you living waters. If you drink, how do you drink of Jesus? Ever thought about that? We eat the bread of life because this word, it's Jesus' thoughts, it's God's thoughts to us, it's life. It's our daily bread. So that's how we eat of it. How do we drink of Jesus? Spending time in his presence. Getting in his presence. Just let him saturate you. Let his spirit fill you afresh and anew. And so we spend, we drink by spending time in his presence. See, he's all powerful. It means he's limitless. He's, he's your advocate, your healer, your redeemer, 
He's forgiven you. He's your comforter and friend. He's your provider. So live your life by seeking him daily. Inviting him into your life daily. Get up in the Lord. Jesus, I need you today. Jesus, I just invite you today. Just begin the day. I invite you to take control of my life today. Right? Put him first. Because if not, everything else is going to be in the wrong place. All right? Get to know him. How do you get to know someone? Talk to him. Right? And you'll be amazed. He'll, amazed. He'll talk back. He will. He'll talk to you. You know, a few years ago, you know, Vice President Pence, you know, people mocked him on the, on the television shows and all this. Uh, you know, he thinks he hears from God every day. Well, we should expect that. Yes. Through his word, right? He'll speak to you through his word, but also he will talk to your heart. He will speak things to your heart. That's good news. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So seek him by inviting him into your life. Get to know him by studying. Love on him. Jesus, I love you. Right? You know, the first time you hear your child or grandchild say, right? in fact, Edie, I was the first one she ever said, I love you to. <laughs> yeah, I, I know my 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 uh, you know daughter and, and Curtis were like what you know, but you know when your child says that in response, I love you too, Dad. Or we my wife come up with this idea and and uh, the kids they're all loving it and the grandkids and and so we did this Advent calendar <laughs> we worked. Actually, that's why we canceled church on December 1st, because we had to get that done. No, no just kidding. <laughs> but we did. We did work that afternoon. We were working, getting it all ready, you know. Actually, it got because uh, Allison and Curtis had got on the way, and so we get these videos. And uh, uh, what was it? Uh, the first one was a little dinosaur. She just loves dinosaurs. Thank you, Nana and Papa. I like my dinosaurs. You know she loves <laughs> She knows more about dinosaurs at three years old than I do at my age. And, and then we got one today, and uh, it was a gingerbread house. <laughs> Thank you, Papa and Nana. And your mom goes, is it good? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so love on him. And then, and then share him, right? Share him with other people. So we invite him into our life on a daily basis. We examine him, and that's studying. We have an expectation, and then we, we, we realize that he is there for us every day. Amen. Amen? Amen? Let's just lift your hands up. Let's just worship him. Lord Jesus, we just honor you, and we praise you, and we glorify you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We invite you right now, Lord. Lord, whatever, whatever your people are needing tonight, Lord, those watching by live stream, Lord, whatever they're needing, thank you for the presence. Thank you for your presence. Lord, I thank you heal broken hearts. I thank you you restore and you mend and you, you recover and you remedy because you're the solution. So often, Lord, we're running here and there and looking and asking and you're the solution. So, Lord, we just thank you right now. You're our wisdom. You're our understanding. And Lord, when we don't know, all we need to do is ask. And I thank you, Lord God, that you will speak to our hearts. And whether it's through your word, as we study it, and you'll lead us to places, Lord God, and there's the answer. Lord, and you speak specifically, directly to our hearts. So we thank you tonight. Lord, we invite you right now into the situations that we're walking through. We invite you into that situation. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We invite you in. And we give you freedom to do what you need to do so that we become more like you. And so the situations and the circumstances change. And so we thank you right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And then expect, Lord, we expect. We expect it. We expect you to change 
We expect you to answer prayers, Lord, because that's what you said in your word. We give you glory and honor. Hallelujah. Has this helped anybody tonight? Yeah. Hallelujah. This is um, not just this time of the year, but I, you know, just thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ coming into this earth, be his entrance into this earth. He's that wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father. In other words, he shows us that he said, I and the Father are one. And then he's the Prince of Peace. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Why don't you stand? Thank you, Lord Jesus. We just honor you. Thank you, Lord. We praise you and magnify you. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. We bless you, Jesus. We worship you. Let's just lift our hands once again up to heaven. Thank you, Lord. Yep. You have a song? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We just worship you. Anybody need prayer for anything tonight before we go? You've come here tonight and you just say, Pastor, I just need prayer. No matter what, if it's healing for your body or just something we can agree with you on, if there's anyone here tonight and you say, Pastor, would you pray? If not, that's fine. We just want to make that invitation. If there's anybody here, you need you need prayer. You need peace in your heart. You need, you need that comfort if you're here tonight because we believe. He is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will yes, do. He will. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. So invite him tomorrow morning when you wake up. Jesus, just take control today. Jesus, I invite you into my life today. Into my, and I understand he's already, you know, if you're born again, he's already there. But, you know, to take your daily life, right? Hallelujah. Father, we praise you and honor you. Thank you for tonight. Thank you that you're here. And we give you all the praise and all the glory and honor. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We'll let Pastor Linda and I get to the back so we can shake your hand. And have a blessed rest of your week.